Okay, good morning. Good, good to see you. I think some people are sick this morning, is that right? Or they just didn't want, want to get out of bed. Which one is it? Well, we're in 1 Timothy, so let's find our way there together. 1 Timothy chapter 4. So, I want you to put yourself back into the time of this book. Let's just kind of transport ourselves back to the first century, okay? Now, I know that's, that's before mobile phones and Xboxes, so don't stress out. We're just going to take a little bit of a visual, okay? Um, the Apostle Paul had been given the responsibility by the Lord to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. And so this, this concept of the church in the Gentile world was a mystery that the Jews didn't understand. Nobody else knew about it, but God gave it to Paul. Uh, when, when the Spirit of God made it clear that, that Saul and Barnabas were to go off into the Gentile world to preach the gospel, the, the church at Antioch sent them out. Paul goes off on his first missionary journey. You know the events that took place there, and numbers of people got saved, and some churches uh, formed, some probably directly by Paul's hand, and some formed as a result of his ministry, but, but not directly by him. And <clears throat> So Paul now is going back on his second missionary journey, and Paul is giving instruction to these churches that have been formed. He, he would have Barnabas with him, or he would have Silas, or soon Timothy here, and, and others that traveled with Paul. And, and in that journey, they were, they were going back around, and they were seeing the brethren that had been saved in their, their previous evangelistic campaigns, if you want to call them that way, in, in these various towns and cities across uh, Asia. And what we see now is Paul is um, he's bringing structure to what was formed. Sometimes he writes a letter back as we read the Ephesus or, you know, Philippians or Colossians, right? He's providing structure to the churches that have been newly formed. And, and in some cases, he's sending others back to set things in order, like Titus or Timothy here. Now, to Timothy, this book of 1 Timothy, this is Timothy, this protege of Paul. We, we know in, in the very first chapter of 1 Timothy that Paul calls him his own son after the common faith. So either Paul won Timothy to Christ, which we don't really know that, or um, he was just his, his mentor uh, as Timothy was called to ministry and Paul mentored him. Either way, um, Paul had a direct investment in, in young Timothy's life. And so Timothy now began his ministry journey following in the footsteps of Paul. And, and he suffered with him. He was persecuted with him. He preached with him. He, uh, he did all that Paul did. And, and that's, there's no better way to get into ministry than that. Amen. Academics are great, but academics are not going to teach you the ministry. Um, you've got to be in it. And that's Timothy. He was in it. But keeping in mind now, Timothy wasn't with Paul in the early days. It was Paul and Barnabas, and, and, but Timothy wasn't there in those early days. In the formation of those churches in the early days, Timothy wasn't a part of that. But when Paul came back and got Timothy, then Timothy began to be a part of Paul's ministry. And now Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, you're new to this church concept. You're, you're new to these evangelistic meetings that we're having. You're, you're new to this, but... Paul was essentially saying to Timothy, I, I'm, I'm not new to this, and so I'm just going to teach you what you need to know about how to manage all of this. Because now that you've traveled with me for a while, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you stay at Ephesus and deal with some things at Ephesus that I, I don't have time to deal with. I've got to be over here in Macedonia, but I'm going to come back. But until I come back, this is what I want you to do. And so, Timothy, you need to understand uh, this is what God expects in the body. This is what the body is. This is your relationship to the body. This is how the body needs to function, how they need to operate. You understand? That's what Paul's doing here. Um, the Timothy, in the body, there's going to be a need for somebody to be over the body. And so, so if, if there's a man that raises his hand and says, I, I think that this is something that I believe God wants me to do, then, Timothy, this is what you tell the man. Well, you're a bishop. You're going to be the overseer and you have to be blameless, and there's all these qualifications. And then, and then Timothy, there's also another thing in the church which, which God set up as an office, and, and that's called a deacon. And so Timothy, 
the deacons are there to serve the church if there's a need in the church. And so if there's a man who's going to be a deacon, then this is what he needs to be. It's not just some volunteer, but it's a volunteer with these spiritual attributes. So, Timothy, this is what the deacon needs to be. You understand, that's what we're doing here in the first century. We're just giving you an understanding, Timothy, of something you don't really under, understand and know by experience, but I'm going to tell you this is what it needs to be. This is how the church needs to function and operate. This is how the body needs to work. So there was a lot in the future, our past, but Timothy's future, that he could not see, did not understand, did not know was coming. And the Spirit of God revealed to Paul, Paul, now there's, there's things that Timothy is going to see here in the church environment but it's all new and people are excited and this is first century Christianity and we've come out of paganism. And we've come out of all the Greek pantheon and all the Roman pantheon, right? The false gods and idolatry of that day. We, we've come out of all of that and we've, we've now seen the truth in the first century and everybody's excited about the fact that finally we understand that, that all of that idolatry of the world is, is of the devil, but there's one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. You understand there's an excitement in the early church. They got delivered from all that idolatry. But the Spirit of God told Paul, there's something coming that, that you need to share with Timothy, and he needs to pass on to the brethren. So that's where we are in 1 Timothy. And I want, you to, I want you to notice in chapter 4, Paul has just finished talking about this mystery of godliness in, at the end of the previous chapter. We, of course, we have chapters here, but Paul was writing a letter. Okay, So this mystery of godliness in verse 16 of chapter 3 God was manifest in the flesh. We talked about this last week. Justified in the spirit. Um, seen of angels. Preached unto the, to the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into, the, into glory. All right. So, Timothy, um, this great mystery that you believed and now you're preaching yourself, um, that's what it is. But, Timothy, understand this. The spirit speaketh expressly. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Look at it. Timothy, the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Timothy. You're excited about what God's doing. And we're seeing Christianity spread for the very first time ever in this part of the world. But the Spirit has told us that something's coming down the road that's different than what you see now. The Spirit speaketh expressly. So what we'll do right now is we'll take these first five verses or so and uh, let's talk this morning about the latter times. Notice in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times... Some shall depart from the faith. So let's talk about what the latter times are. Father, use the Word of God to help us this morning. Uh, give us instruction and good understanding so that we'll know uh, the age in which we live and then how to navigate this Christian life in, in this age. Um, so uh, we ask for understanding and wisdom in the Scriptures this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's talk about what the latter times are. We've all heard that, the latter times, right? Um, here's what they are. They, they are distinctly, it says, the Spirit speaketh expressly. In other words, the Spirit of God has very uh, distinctly and unmistakably here plainly describing something that's coming in the future. It, he speaketh expressly. So the Spirit of God told Paul this, and, and there was no ambiguity about it. Sometimes uh, the Word of God has some ambiguous things. There are things you have to dive into and, and discern and study that are maybe not immediately clear, but they take a lot of other scripture, okay? That's not the way this was. It was the Spirit of God saying to Paul, Paul, there is something coming in the future. This is what it is in the latter times. So this gives the sense of an importance here, a distinction. In other words, it's the Spirit of God saying, pay attention to this. Pay close attention to this, that something's coming in these latter times. So what do they refer to? Um, we'll come back here, obviously, but go with me to Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 3. All right, Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> what do they refer to? Now, in order for us to understand that, we need to know where we are today. So Ephesians chapter 3, 
Paul said in verse number one, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he may know unto me the mystery, uh, drop down verse five, what's the mystery? Which in other ages was not known unto the sons of men, but as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. We are in what we call, obviously, this dispensation of grace. God, God uh, dealing with men at this particular time in this particular way, the grace of God. Okay, So that's how does it work in the Gentile world. So uh, the Jew was put to the side temporarily because they rejected the Messiah. And now the gospel goes to the Gentiles, right? So Paul raises up one born out of, or God raises up one born out of due season, the apostle Paul. And what's his ministry? To take the gospel to the Gentile world, right? So we're living in that now. And that's been going on for the better part of 2,000 years, this, this dispensation of the grace of God. So the, that's where Paul was at. And that's where we are at in this dispensation of grace. But notice he said to Timothy here that the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times and these things are going to happen. So if we know that we're living in this dispensation of grace, then we have to be able to define, well, what are these latter times that Paul is talking about? Now, to understand that, go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. So we know that we're reading through the New Testament. The New Testament was completed around 96 A.D. So all of these books in the New Testament were written, you know, somewhere in a 60-ish year period of time, okay? So that includes the book of Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 1, and notice what it says here. This is the beginning of it. God who at sundry times, that means various times, and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also... He made the worlds. All right, notice, God who at sundry times in various ways and various times in the past spoke to the prophets back then. He says in verse number two, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Okay, hang on a minute. We already know that we live in the dispensation of the grace of God, right? We know that we're all living in that dispensation where God deals with us according to grace. Okay, so if we know that we're all living in that dispensation as Paul was living in that dispensation, then it says here that in the last days that God has spoken to us by His Son. You see, in, see what he says? Well, isn't that what Paul said to Timothy, that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith? He's using the same terminology here. So these last days, whatever they are, they begin in the ministry of Jesus Christ where He was speaking unto us that's what he said, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So the last days, we, we were part of the last days in Paul's day, but we are still part of the last days in our day. One of the struggles we have as believers is this. Um, we want everything to be, or we presume everything's going to be on our time frame, right? But they're not on our time frame. The apostles felt exactly the same way. Acts chapter 1, just before Jesus ascended up into heaven. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Right? They were saying, okay, well, you died. Uh, we didn't see that coming. And now you rose from the dead. We didn't see that coming. So, hey, you must be the king. I mean, we accept the fact that all power is given to you, right? We accept all of that. So I guess it's time for you to set up the kingdom. All right? So they were looking at everything according to their time frame. But what do we see about God's time frame? It's way different than ours, right? Uh, so we're interested in time, and God is interested in timing. And his timing is different than ours. So we're looking at the last days and we're saying, well, if it's the last days, it must mean everything's coming to a conclusion right now. But we know that God allows things to stretch out far beyond what our time frame is because he has his own times and seasons that he understands and we don't understand. So what we know is that these last days existed in Paul's day because it's what it says, that, that in the last days, God spoke to us by His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that started in the ministry of Christ. Are, do you understand what I'm saying? So the, what I'm saying to you is these last days or these latter days have existed for a long time. I mean, the last 2,000 years. These, this is the period of the last days. But what Paul is giving reference to here in 1 Timothy 4 is there's this downward, downward spiral of wickedness that's just getting worse and worse and worse 
as these last days continue. So drop back a few pages to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and <clears throat> we'll look at it. So these, these last days are things that are a period of time in which Paul also lived, and we're living in it as well, but the latter part of the last days. Does that make sense to you? So this is the last days, but here we are. We're in the latter part of the last days. Okay, the last days, God's been dealing with man for 6,000 years, but now this last couple thousand years, we're in the last days, but now there's some latter times of the last days. If that doesn't spin your brain out, I don't know what will. So if you're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now we look at this, and here's what we might be thinking future, but we've got to understand Paul is writing to Timothy 2,000 years ago, and he's saying, hey, Timothy, perilous times are going to come later on. All right, so in the last days, perilous times shall come. Um, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I'll tell you what, that's quite a laundry list of character traits, isn't it? Amen. I mean, if we were going to choose to live anywhere, it would be where this isn't, right? I don't want to live in this generation. But this is where we're living. This is the description of our world today. Amen. It was not the description of the general world in Paul's day. I mean, these characteristics have always been in man. But as a, as a whole in society... Uh, in professing Christianity, this was not the character of the first century believers or the first century world. But they were coming in the future. So if you drop over to 1 Timothy then where we were, these latter times are referring to what's happening in professing Christianity in our day. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. He's not talking about, the Spirit of God is not warning about uh, Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam. That's not what this is talking about. It's a departure from whatever we'd consider to be the faith. You understand? Professing Christianity. Amen. That's what this is talking about. So some shall depart from the faith. The faith. So in this, in this dispensation of, of grace, it's considered the last times, but the Spirit is saying distinctly now that there is coming a period of time in these last times, the latter days of the last times, and something is going to happen here. Are we clear on this? Do you understand? Okay. So you're living in those days right now. Paul was living in the last days. Timothy was living in the last days. We're living in the last days. But this is the latter times of it. We're at the end of it now. Okay. So we're living in these days right now. So let's talk about what they bring these latter times that we're living in. What do these days bring? And there's six character traits, right? Six characteristics of these last days that the Spirit of God is warning us about. So let's look at it first of all in verse uh, number one, these, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. If you were to just take this at face value with a casual reading, you would think that, oh, maybe this is just talking about somebody who walked away from Christianity and, you know, lost their salvation or something like that. But obviously we know that's not what we're talking about, right? Number one, if you're saved, you can't lose it. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. We do believe that, right? You're secure in Christ? Okay. So this isn't a person losing their salvation. This is a, a departure from what somebody held as it related to the whole revealed truth of God, the faith. And there, there are people, there are some that will depart from what God says the faith is. Now, we've looked at this before, but I think it's important for us to look at it again so that we understand exactly what the Bible's talking about. So, the expression here is that there's going to be a movement away from those who profess to believe something, this belief about the truth of the gospel. They're going to, they're going to move away from this. There's a departure from this. So, it doesn't mean that an individual uh, that did this is actually saved. Some are going to depart from the faith, but it doesn't say that they're born again. But there's just a falling away from this body of revealed truth that God gives us in the New Testament as it pertains to Jesus Christ. So you're in 1 Timothy, go to Titus, all right? First and 2 Timothy, and look at verse uh, Titus 
and this will clear it up. I'm sure you remember this as we, we dealt with this a number of weeks ago, but Paul is talking to Titus in, in this epistle, and notice in verse 4, he says, To Titus, mine own son, after what? After the common faith. After the common faith. That's what he's talking about here. What Paul said to Timothy is what Paul was saying to Titus. Titus, you're my own son. We have a kinship after the common faith. What is the faith? It's the faith of Jesus Christ. It's, we're talking about the gospel story here, right? The truth of the gospel. That's what we call this, the faith, this body of truth as it relates to Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we wouldn't have to argue at all that the gospel message is the most important doctrine in the word of God as it relates to the world around us. Prophecy has its place and other things have their place, but the most important message for the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Because men can't be saved without it. That's the common faith that he's talking about. It's not, it's not everything else in the Bible, although that's a part of it, but the, the, the foundation of this faith is the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You're my son after the common faith. So Paul is saying to Timothy, hey, Timothy, in the latter days... The Spirit has plainly, distinctly told us that some are going to depart from the faith. This body of truth, as it relates to Jesus Christ, they're going to depart from that. They professed that they believed that, but they're going to depart from that, all right? So what, what do we call that today? Well, we call that apostasy. That's the word, apostasy. This increasing apostasy. So it's a turning away of religious people from the simplicity of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And... This has been seen to be true in church history, this apostasy. If you've ever studied any part of church history, you've seen this happen. So this, this first love of the early church. Okay, so we have Ephesus, for example. The greatest example you have, right? When you read the book of Ephesians, what do you read? You read Paul writing to the saints at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And in, in the book of Ephesians, you have this body of truth that is so deep. The, the, the meat of the word of God is here. And you have so much that's rich in truth in the book of Ephesians. It's this amazing book of doctrine, okay? But when you just get a number of years later, 30 years later, and you get to, um, you get to Revelation chapter 2, the apostle John is writing to the same church. And in just 30 years, they left their first love, right? What is that? That's it's a coldness, the beginnings of apostasy, the church had a first love in its, in its early church years, but that began to die away. It wasn't just Ephesus. It was it's Christianity as a whole or professing Christianity as a whole. So the early church, that first love of the early church began to die away. And as, as succeeding generations were born and, and came into the church, then <clears throat> what we have is something that was different in the succeeding generations than you had in the original, in the early church. Now church is just simply a tradition for some. It's just what we do. We were born into this. Uh, this is what we do. And so that's how it became. Not everybody was this way, but some, right? Some that were professing, um, some. And so now it's just a tradition. It's a pattern of behavior. And so in due course, if that's the way it is, you started out right, but then as succeeding generations of the church were born and the church continued on, it lost its, its first love, it lost its distinct character, characteristic, and successive generations now were just here, and they were Christianized, but they weren't Christians. We see the difference. They were Christianized, they, they had the Bible, they had the accoutrements of Christianity, but they were not converted. They were unconverted. So they were Christianized, but they weren't truly born again. They weren't actually Christians. And so in due course, if you have a church environment that way, in due course, what's going to happen in the church is you're going to have false doctrine rise up and take root because there's not any real truth there. They're just holding on to tradition, but there was no, there was no conversion, no real change spiritually that took place. And so you have false doctrine that arises from this system. Now listen to me. This is a system of religion that we're talking about. It professed biblical Christianity at one time. It professed to believe the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ at one time. And people hanged their hats on that and they said, this is what we are and this is what we believe. But in due time, over a period of generations and generations and generations, 
the succeeding generations that were born into this system of professing Christianity no longer believed that body of truth as it related to Jesus Christ. So they had the trappings of Christianity. They had a form of godliness, if you will, but there was, there was no conversion, no truth on the inside of it. It just had a shell, but there was no substance on the inside of it. And so <clears throat> because of a gradual departure of sound doctrine, truly born-again people, uh, truth, it was just a, a small step from this into a pagan belief system that was cloaked in Christian terms. You with me? All right. So they were, they're going to depart from the faith. That's what Paul's re referring to. Hey, Timothy, it hasn't happened yet. We're in the early church and people are still excited and it's not a Christianized world. There's just Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, but the rest of the city is pagan. But Timothy, there's going to come a day when much of the world is Christianized, but then there are going to be some that depart from that. They depart from that body of revealed truth as it relates to Jesus Christ, the faith. Now, what do they do? It says they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, chapter 4 and verse number 1. So I want you to notice that the falling away here that he's talking about uh, is the result of the influence of unclean spirits. Now go back with me to 1 Kings, if you will. 1 Kings chapter 22. Let's look at this. The influence of unclean spirits in the world today. <clears throat> So I know I'm, I'm speaking to uh, mature believers, you that are in the faith. So we understand and believe, we know it to be true, that, um, that there is a dimension that we cannot see around us. Amen. A spiritual dimension we cannot see. There are angels, there are devils. There is Satan who walks around. Peter tells us this, 1 Peter 5, right? As a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What does he do? In 1 Corinthians, he transforms himself into an angel of light, but he's not an angel. He's a fallen cherub. So we see that there is a spiritual dimension that we cannot see with the visible eye, but we understand it to be true. Now that spiritual dimension has, uh, <clears throat> has light and dark inside of it. Okay, You have the ministers of God, which are the angels, uh, fulfilling the desire of our Father. And then you have the fallen cherub, Satan, the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, and those angels that have fallen from their exalted position before God now to follow Him. And uh, we know at least a third of the angel, angelic host has fallen to that. Okay, So you have this warfare that's being waged in the background between the will and purpose of God as it relates to men and the will and purpose of Satan as it relates to men. There's a warfare that's going on. It's been going on since Satan fell. And so God, as He does in various places, he's, I've used this expression, but He kind of pulls the curtain back and lets us see some things that we don't ordinarily see. Here it is in 1 Kings chapter 22. So here's, um, <clears throat> here is Micaiah, this uh, prophet. This is such a great chapter. If you've never read this chapter, read this in your devotions one day. Just sit down and read it. It'll, it'll, uh, it's a blessing to read this. This guy had courage. If you want to be a man of courage, read this story, all right? So he's standing before this wicked king, and he's just going to tell it like it is, all right? So we're on 1 Kings 22, verse number 19. Here's what Micaiah the prophet said. He said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? Now, who's Ahab? King. He's the king, wicked king. Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Okay, hang on a minute. God is on his throne, and all the host of heaven, whatever that is, are spread out before him on his right and on his left. And God says to the host, Who can go and persuade Ahab the king to go to the city of Ramoth Gilead so that he can die? God said, I'm looking for an executioner. Anybody got any ideas? So notice it says, and there, uh, in verse 20, and one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. Now picture this, guys. We're not talking about some people sitting around the pub having a conversation. We're talking about the God of heaven who is seated before all of the hosts that he created, and yet there are unclean spirits, devils that are here, and God gathers them together and says, I have a purpose. I want Ahab to die. Have you guys got any ideas about how to make this happen? 
And so one said on this manner and another said on this manner. Can you picture this in your mind? It's almost like somebody, one of these unclean spirits raising their hand says, well, I've got an idea. And then somebody on this side of it says, well, no, I've got an idea. One said on this manner and another said on that manner. Verse 21, and there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said, wherewith? In other words, how are you going to do that? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, this is God, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Well, one, one devil had a, an idea and another one had another idea. And eventually one came and stood before the Lord and said, I've got a plan. I can do it. How are you going to do that? I'll go and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. Notice it was a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. What are prophets? Religious leaders of some sort. I will go and I will influence those that claim to be religious and speak for God. And I will be a lying spirit in their mouth so that they will lie to the people. Isn't that what he was saying? Amen. Okay. So if you'll go back with me to 1 Timothy then. <clears throat> Paul said in these last days... There are going to be those that profess Christianity. There's going to be a system of religion that used to profess truth, but they're going to depart from what they professed as it relates to Jesus Christ, this body of truth. And that what they're going to do is, do is they're going to give heed to seducing spirits, just like what we read in 1 Kings 22. Amen. Just that way. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits. They were brought up understanding the faith. But they denied it, and they chose the influence of evil spirits instead. They are going to depart. Whose responsibility is that? The action is on the part of those people. It's not on the part of the seducing spirits. The people walk away from what they profess to believe. They willfully depart from it. Amen. After church today, I will depart. I make a choice to walk out the door. Okay? They are walking away. Whoever these people are, they're going to walk away from the truth. All right? Look with me in 2 Peter chapter 2. Turn over there. <clears throat> How is it that they choose to succumb to the influence of evil spirits? How does that happen? 2 Peter chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers. Don't, don't miss that. False teachers among you. Hey, listen, church. Among you, that's what he's saying, who privily, that means privately, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. You know what pernicious means? Destructive. That's what the word means. <clears throat> and many shall follow their pernicious or their destructive ways Timothy, so by reason there, of Timothy whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Many will follow that. So these people now, they are departing from the faith. And it says many will follow their ways, the ways of the false teachers. So notice what these people are doing. If you go back with me to 1 Timothy. So we know that Satan is operating in the realm of false teachers. We know that he's operating in the realm of religious, uh, uh, professing Christianity, religion, okay? And, and they're going to give heed. These people are going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, not biblical doctrine, but the doctrines of devils. So notice what they're doing. They're speaking lies, verse 2, are you there? 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2, they're speaking lies in hypocrisy. Okay, listen, these lies are being positioned as spiritual truths. Are you with me? Are we okay? Everybody good? Brother Dan, are we good on that? Okay, so here's what you have. You have, you have religious leaders who are professing Christianity, they are professing to believe the truth of God as it's related to us in His Word, but what they are deliberately doing is giving heed to the doctrines of devils working in the background and influencing them, and though they know they're wrong because of the wickedness that they have, they will lie to the people, and they'll lie hypocritically knowing that they're wrong, but they want to destroy the people. So they're speaking lies to the people deliberately, and that's what makes it so insidious. It looks like Christianity on the outside, 
but it is deliberately deceptive and the false teachers know that they're being deceptive and they do it to destroy the people. It's deception. Keep in mind, this is referring to hypocritical religious leaders who are deliberately deceiving the people that are underneath of them. That's what this is all talking about here, okay? Notice in verse uh, chapter 2, they speak lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You ever burned yourself? Uh, I've done that numbers of times. One time as a kid burnt right here quite severely, and, and still today there's a patch where I can't feel anything. You ever burned yourself on your skin real bad? Okay, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Okay, this is a picture of a hot iron being applied to the skin. It burns the nerve endings, and God is, God is teaching us something here. Um, their conscience is not, it's not something tangible. You can't put an iron on the conscience, wherever the conscience is. It's not something tangible, but um, it becomes hardened and without feeling when it's seared. That's what it, their conscience. So what's the conscience? We've looked at this. It's a compound of two words, con and science. Con means with, science means knowledge. With knowledge, God has put into us an innate knowledge of truth that we were born with, Amen. we were born with as far as what is right and what is wrong. And their conscience is now being seared, uh, and that's what it is. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. They don't have a, a conscience anymore. And Jesus predicted that this was going to happen, this this dead conscience. Jesus said to his apostles, his apostles in John 16 before he went to the cross, he said, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh. Do you remember when Jesus said this? Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Their conscience will be so seared that they will murder you and think they're doing it for God. Okay? Now, that was the, the Pharisees, the chief priests that he was referring to. But in these latter times... Paul said to Timothy, hey, Timothy, there's a system of religion that's going to exist that's going to look like Christianity, but they have departed from the tenets of Christianity. They have the outward show to some extent. But those who are in charge have given heed to the spirits of devils and the doctrines of devils that seduce them, and they are lying to you. And what they say to you, they don't even believe themselves. They're hypocrites but they are deceiving you because their conscience has been seared and they can no longer feel their conscience is burned with a hot iron. So let's observe now in 1 Timothy 4 um, the type of teachings that these devils are introducing into professing Christianity. Don't forget this. This is demonic stuff that's been introduced into professing Christianity. That's what this is. So he says, verse 3, what is the first thing? Forbidding to marry. Forbidding to marry. Now it will hardly be a surprise as we're looking at this, to see that this is very plainly referring to the Roman Catholic religion. You're not going to get around that. This, this, is, this has got to be Roman Catholicism that's being referred to because we're not talking about Hinduism. Hinduism doesn't claim to have its basis in Christianity. We're not talking about Buddhism or Islam or any other Zoroastrianism or any other thing, Wicca, any other kind of religion in the world today that is non-Christian in its origin. He said there are going to be those who depart from the faith. In other words, professing to believe the faith of Christianity about Jesus Christ. Okay. And what is one of their tenet doctrines? They forbid to marry. Okay. Do, do you see this? This is very plain. That's why it says that the Spirit speaketh expressly. He's very clear about it. So it's a plain statement. It doesn't have any room for misinterpretation. The apostasy of Christianity will forbid marriage for certain people. Forbidding to marry is what he said. So let me just read you something from the Council of Trent. 24th session. This is the 10th canon of the Council of Trent in 1563. I'm not making it up. You can look it up. Okay. Here's what it says. Quote, If anyone saith that the marriage state is to be placed above the state of virginity or of celibacy, and that it is not better and more blessed to remain in virginity or in celibacy than to be united in matrimony, let him be anathema. Okay, what's anathema? Do you know what that word means? Cursed. Let him be cursed. Okay, that's the Council of Trent. What are they saying? They forbid marriage. They forbid marriage amongst certain ki kinds or classes of people. Of course, you know the priests and others, right? And that, that, that are not allowed to be married. But what does the Bible say in Hebrews? Well, marriage is honorable. What did God say in Genesis? It's not good that a man should be alone. What did God say about a pastor? He can be the husband of one wife. So you're either going to believe what they say or you can believe what the Word of God says. 
But what is that? That's a doctrine of devils. Now, if we're speaking plainly this morning, um, those in the professing Christian world that do not marry and set themselves in religious authority over the people are quite often the ones that are found out later to be deviants, abusers, pedophiles, perverted and twisted, corrupt, right? There is a safeguard that God has given to the minister, and that safeguard is his marriage, forbidding to marry. Back to 1 Timothy 4. Notice nextly it says, and uh, verse number 3, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now the meats described here, he didn't say meat necessarily specifically, all right? But the meats indicate that there are certain kinds of foods that were prohibited at certain times. That's what he's talking about, meats, okay? So let me just read something from the Archdiocese of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. This is what they say. Since Jesus sacrificed his flesh for us on Good Friday, which he didn't, by the way, okay, uh, we refrain from eating flesh meat in his honor on Fridays. Flesh meat includes the meat of mammals and poultry, and the main foods that come under this heading are beef and pork, chicken and turkey. Uh, while flesh is prohibited, the non-flesh products of these animals are not. Things like milk, cheese, butter, and eggs. Fish do not belong to, belong to the flesh meat category. The Latin word for meat, caro, from which we get English words like carnivore, applies strictly to flesh meat and has never been understood to include fish. Furthermore, in former times, flesh meat was more expensive, eaten only occasionally, and associated with feasting and rejoicing, whereas fish was cheap, eaten more often, and not associated with celebrations. Okay, I'm going to read this last paragraph too. Abstinence is a form of penance. Penance expresses sorrow and contrition for our wrongdoing, indicates our intention to turn away from sin and turn back to God, and makes reparation for our sins. Does this sound bad to anybody that knows the Bible? It helps to cancel the debt and pay the penalties incurred by our transgressions. Everything I just read you is absolute nonsense and completely unscriptural. Amen. Completely. And quite easy to prove in the English language about the first grade reading level. It's easy to prove. Commanding to abstain from meats. I remember when I was in high school, and I didn't even understand why. It was always fish on Friday. We had the hot lunches at school. I don't know if you do that here in Australia, but I went to public school as a kid in America, and, and the, so we paid to have lunch at the school. I didn't have to bring my little bag, right? And so on Fridays, there was never burgers or anything else. It was always fish on Fridays. And I never knew why that was. Well, this is why, the influence of Catholicism in the public schools in America, okay? Well, what does the Bible say about this subject? You, you understand the Bible deals with all of this. God deal, deals with all of this. So you're in 1 Timothy, look at chapter 4, verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Uh, one, of my, one of my good friends who has now married somebody in my family, so I guess we're technically related. He's um, he's Filipino guy, lovely guy, okay? I'm looking at you now, and uh, lovely guy. He likes to eat octopus, okay? And he likes to eat these little ones, these little baby things with the tentacles, and he'll just grab them with a chopstick. And, and I look at him and I say, that cannot be right. That, that cannot be right, right? And I search in vain through the Bible, and you know what I find? Every creature of God is good, but only if it be received with thanksgiving. See, it's not good for me because I'm not going to thank God for that. I'm just, I refuse, okay? If you want to have a pork chop after lunch today, or after church today, go have a pork chop. If you want to eat octopus or squid or whatever, you go do that. If you want to eat a steak, you go do that. If you want to have chicken or fish, you do whatever you want to do. Because everything God made, you can eat, unless it just happens to be poisonous, okay? Don't eat that. Nothing to be refused. Isn't that what he said? But sometimes we who are saved, we get saved out of a religious background and it was drilled into us for years and years that this is wrong. And so we bring that into our salvation, right, into our Christian life, but we don't understand because it was so imprinted into us from years gone by. You can just relieve yourself of any burden like that. Whatever God made, if you're daring enough to eat it, well, God bless you, you go eat it, okay? Okay. If you're just plain and ordinary and you just want meat and potatoes, that's a safe place to be. But you can have whatever you want to have. It's okay. Every creature of God. So you, you, can, you can consume it. It's, it's not a religious duty to abstain from meats. It's ridiculous. 
The only reason we abstain from steak in our house is because it's like $40 a kilo. That's why. Um, <clears throat> let me read you a couple of verses. I, I don't want to take too much time. Here's Jesus. He has everybody, he has everybody sit down. These multitudes, he's going to feed them, the, the fish and the bread, right? It says, he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and it says, and he gave thanks, and then he broke, and he gave to his disciples to set before them. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus in the upper room with just the 12 that are there. You remember, he's going to have that meal with him. With great desire, have a desire to eat this meal with you, right? It says, he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave to him, said, take, eat. He gave thanks. You know, when we sit down to a meal... As, as individuals or families or whatever, and somebody prays for the food. You understand that's not just a religious tradition. What are we supposed to do? Tick the box. I thank God for my food. And I'm guilty of this. I couldn't tell you how many countless times in my life that I'll bow my head and I'll say a prayer that has become so habitual that I'm not even talking to God. I'm saying words. You know, we just need to rein it back, put the pause button for a minute, and just take a breath and say, God, thank you for this food. That's what Jesus did. He gave thanks. What was he doing? He was giving us an example. Paul is giving us instruction. Jesus gave an example. Paul gives instruction. If it be received with thanksgiving, being thankful for the food. Let's take the time that we ought to take today. Now, listen, don't pray for everybody on the church prayer list. Your steak's going to get cold. But just thank God for the food. There's some people, you know, there's always that person. You don't ask them to pray. Because right? you fall asleep in your suit before they're done. right? But we, we know the truth about food. We thank God that He's given it to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me just read you this verse. Just, you might write this down if, you, if you're in the habit of doing that. 1 Corinthians 8, 8. For meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. You don't earn any favor and brownie points with God because you abstain from this or because you ate this. It doesn't commend you to God doesn't deepen your relationship with the Lord because you do or do not eat this particular thing. So just enjoy. There is nothing better, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, than that a man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It's the gift of God. Just enjoy it. God gave you taste buds for a reason. All right, enjoy them. Um, so nothing is to be refused. Okay. It is sanctified, it says, by the word of God in prayer. This has, become, this has been very confusing to people, but it's really not actually all that confusing. So when, we, when he says it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer, that to, to be sanctified means it's made lawful to us. It's lawful to us to eat. In other words, it's okay for us to consume this because it's sanctified by the word of God. What does that mean? Well, through the instruction we receive in the Bible where God says you can eat it. It, it, it is lawful to me. To the Jew, it was not lawful to eat certain things. But Paul is saying, no, everything is good because it's sanctified by the word of God. In other words, it's made lawful to you because the Word of God gives you instruction and tells you you can eat this. It's okay. And prayer. In other words, it's the thanksgiving of God's provision for your food. Thank you, Lord, for this. God says, eat it. Enjoy it. All right? That's why I made it for you. Is that clear? So I know we're all hungry. They're talking about steak for the last 10 minutes. So I can feel my stomach, right? So it'll be a short message here after a while. But um, so specifically, we can see this religious system that God is, is warning about. Let me just say this before we're done today. I have met many people in this system of religion. Some of you may got saved out of that. <clears throat> that, were not, that were not hypocritical and did not know that what they were being taught was wrong. They didn't know. They were just brought up in that system of religion. Uh, but I also know people that got saved out of that and their eyes were opened and now they look back at what they were, were trained and raised to believe in that system of professing Christianity. And they realize how awful and, and oppressive it really was because there's no truth in it. And God is just saying to Timothy, Timothy, you need to understand this doesn't exist right now, but there's a day coming in professing Christianity in this world where, where it's going to be cloaked in Christian terms and, and trappings, but there's no truth there because the basis of all of it is the doctrines of devils. Amen. And what's the end result of that? When they speak lies as it relates to Jesus Christ, they are going to deceive millions and, listen, billions of people who are going to die and go to hell because they believed these doctrines that came from the devil himself. So we just have to be very aware of that, okay? Father, thank you for your word today, and uh, I pray that you would uh, just bless it. 
uh, as we meditate on it, think about it, and uh, are cautious of it. Help us, Lord, to have great compassion on those that are involved in this system of religious belief, to be able to share the truth of Jesus Christ that makes them free. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have in the Lord. Uh, I pray you'd bless now in our uh, time of uh, fellowship and then the morning service that you'd be, uh, you'd be pleased with the preaching, teaching of your word. Help us to do all that we ought, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.